Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you're watching lesson 11.4 on shifting equilibrium. Uh, in this lesson we're going to cover what's called Le Chatelier's principle um, and that's basically what happens to a system uh, that is at equilibrium when we stress it out. In the picture I've got on the screen right now we've got an equilibrium system. This guy bailing water out of the boat. Uh, we know the system is at equilibrium because the water level in the boat isn't changing. Uh, take a few seconds, brainstorm at least two different ways where you could disrupt the equilibrium in this boat. All right, so you might be thinking, um, I could get the guy a bigger bucket than the amount of water getting removed from the boat. It should be greater than the amount of water coming into the boat. Um, you might have thought I could take the bucket away and kind of stop that reverse reaction, or I might be able to patch the hole or make the hole bigger, and that should also affect the amount of water coming into the boat. Um, needless to say, this is not what an equilibrium system looks like for chemical equilibrium, but you're getting the idea. All right, uh, so Le Chatelier's principle states that a system at equilibrium will remain in equilibrium unless acted upon by an outside force. Uh, basically, once you've got a closed system that has established equilibrium, that forward and reverse reaction will just continue occurring at the same rate until you stress it out. When you do stress it, uh, whether it's changing the concentration, the temperature, the pressure, so on and so forth, the system reacts to alleviate that stress. Um, in other words, it's just going to try to undo what you did. Uh, so let's say you increase the concentration of one of the reactants, it's going to try to decrease the concentration. You make the system colder, it's going to try to increase the temperature of the system. So just a little bit more about equilibrium and shifting it in general. Um, stress disrupts equilibrium systems by causing either the forward or the reverse reaction rate to increase. Uh, you can tell right now we've got a system at equilibrium because the concentration of H2, NH3, and N2 are all constant. We're going to disrupt this equilibrium by adding in some more H2. And you can see the second we do that, the system starts to respond. Eventually, after um, enough time has been given, the system will reestablish equilibrium, uh, but it's not necessarily going to be the same equilibrium points, or in other words, the same concentrations at equilibrium that were there initially. What we're looking at with Le Chatelier's principle is what's happening immediately after you stress the system. So for example, we've added H2, and you can see after it's added, the system immediately starts to decrease its concentration. The concentration of N2 also starts to decrease after H2 has been added, and the concentration of NH3 does start to increase. Uh, eventually, equilibrium is reestablished. So just a little bit more with terminology before we get into um, how to predict which way the equilibrium is going to shift. Anytime you've got a change that um, increases the concentrations of the products, we would say the equilibrium has shifted to the right because the, uh, the substances on the right side of the reaction arrow have experienced an increase in concentration. You might also hear this called or explained as the forward reaction is favored. Again, because we're favoring um, increasing the concentration of the products. If the reactants increase in concentration, we could say the equilibrium shifts to the left or that the reverse reaction was favored. Uh, remember, it's kind of like a little seesaw. Um, if we've got you know, reactants, reversible reaction arrow and products, it's impossible for both sides to experience an increase in concentration simultaneously. As the concentration of the reactants goes up, the concentration of the products has to go down and vice versa. All right, so let's look at an example. Let's look at this reaction. Uh, the synthesis of ammonia, 3H2 plus 2N2 yields 2NH3 plus heat. Um, so we've got a system that kind of looks like this, with our little uh, white diatomic molecules are H2, the blue ones are N2, and this of course is NH3. And your equilibrium systems, everything's just kind of mixed together. You don't have reactants on one side and products on the other, especially if you're working with gases. Um, the forward reaction is exothermic, that's so why we've got heat on the, reaction, uh, on the product side of the equation, so forward is exo, therefore the reverse reaction must be endothermic, and that's going to play a role um, when we start looking at temperature changes and how the system will um, adjust or um, respond to that stress. All right, uh, so let's start off with concentration. 
you got the same reaction, and let's say that you're going to increase the concentration of H2 by adding some more hydrogen in. You can imagine as there's more hydrogen just kind of floating around in the system, the odds of collisions between the nitrogen and three hydrogen molecules increase. More H2, better opportunities for it to run into N2. As those molecules collide, if they do so effectively, the concentration of the reactants, hydrogen and nitrogen gas, should decrease, and the concentration of NH3, our product, should increase. So this is what we'd predict. Uh, we could say the equilibrium shifts to the right, or that the forward reaction is favored. Again, shift to the right, forward reaction favors, just means that, that uh, the change or the stress has allowed more product to be produced. Let's look at another one. Let's say you add more N2 gas. Collisions between nitrogen and hydrogen will most likely increase, causing the concentration of the reactants to decrease, and the concentration of the product to increase again. Still, we'd say that the equilibrium shifts to the right and that the forward reaction is favored. Now, let's say that we add more NH3 to this system. Now the collisions between NH3 molecules are more likely to occur, so we should see a decrease in the concentration of ammonia and increases in the concentration of our reactants, H2 and N2. This means that equilibrium has shifted to the left and that the reverse reaction is favored. Uh, so essentially, any time you add more of a substance, um, the system is going to react to get rid of that extra substance. So if you add something in on the reactant side, the forward reaction will be favored. Use the reactants to make the products. Let's see what happens when we decrease the concentration. We'll remove some hydrogen. Now our collisions between N2 and H2 are less likely, and because some of the H2 has been removed, collisions between ammonia molecules are more likely. So if we take away some H2, the system is going to shift to the left, increasing the concentration of hydrogen and nitrogen, our reactants, and we would say the reverse reaction is favored. You might imagine that the same exact thing will happen if we remove N2 for the same reasons, less nitrogen for the hydrogen to collide with, so there's just a better chance of the ammonia molecules, NH3s, colliding for an effective collision. And if that's what you thought, you're absolutely right. The concentration of our reactants will increase, our product will decrease. Again, we'll say that the equilibrium shifts to the left and that the reverse reaction has been favored. If we remove some NH3, if we remove some ammonia, the collisions between the H2 and the N2 are more likely. So we'll see an increase in concentration of ammonia, say that the system shifts to the right or the equilibrium shifts to the right, and that the forward reaction has been favored. Whenever you remove a substance, whether it's on the products or the reactant side, the system is going to shift to replace that substance. In other words, it will favor the reaction, either forward or reverse, where um, it will be producing the substance that you removed. If we look at pressure, uh, we know that the only phase of matter that's really affected by changes in pressure are gases. And as you can clearly see, we've got nothing but gases in this equation. Um, looking at how pressure is going to impact equilibrium has to do with how many moles of gas you have on each side of the equation. So I've got three moles of H2 plus, two mole, uh, plus one mole of N2 gives me a total of four moles of gas on the reactant side. Over on the product side, there are two moles of NH3. All right, uh, so let's say that we increase the pressure. We can usually do this by just kind of confining the molecules to a smaller space. If pressure is increased, effectively we've made it more crowded for the system. The system wants to make it less crowded. Does the reactant side or the product side represent fewer moles of gas? And we just talked about it, it's the product side. Um, with increased pressure, you've got more likely collisions between um, the four moles of gas side so we'll end up seeing a decrease in concentration of hydrogen and nitrogen gas and an increase in the concentration of ammonia. Equilibrium shifts to the right, and the forward reaction was favored. 
If we decrease the pressure, we've basically given the molecules more space and the system's going to want to use up that space. Uh, so in that case, we'd favor the uh, reactant side because that has more moles of gas. If you decrease the pressure for this system, we're going to shift towards the left, favoring the reverse reaction. Uh, and we'll shift to the side with more moles of gas. Anytime you deal with changing pressure, you have to pay attention to the number of moles of gas on each side of the equation. All right, uh, changing temperature. So this is where we have to really pay attention to where the heat term is. If we increase the temperature, we kind of think about uh, just extra energy being put into the system or extra heat, the system's going to want to use that heat. Effectively, we've increased the concentration of heat or we've increased one of the products, uh, so the system's going to want to get rid of it. We'll favor the endothermic reaction, which uses heat. In this case, we'll shift to the left. That means we'll favor the reverse reaction. If we decrease the temperature, now we have less heat. The system's going to want to increase the temperature by favoring the exothermic reaction. In this case, that's the forward reaction. We're going to shift to the right and increase the concentration of ammonia, NH3. All right, uh, those are the three big changes to be aware of. Changes in concentration, both increases and decreases. Uh, changes in pressure, look for gas. Changes in temperature, see what side of the equation the heat term is on. There are two others that come up from time to time. Uh, the addition of an inert gas. When we say inert, we just mean non-reactive. Um, and non-reactive gases are found almost exclusively on uh, group 18 of the periodic table. Your noble gases do not react. So let's say I add in some neon. Let's throw them in there. You might be wondering, well, should that have an impact at all? It isn't going to react with either of the reactants or the product. And you're absolutely right. There is no shift. Neither reaction is favored. Uh, basically, the partial pressure of all the gases change by the same factor, so it does not uh, change the rate of the forward or the reverse reaction, and the system's going to remain at equilibrium. Uh, from time to time, you also see examples where a catalyst has been added. Uh, we know that a catalyst increases the rate of a chemical reaction by providing an alternative path with lower activation energy. So the forward reaction will definitely go faster because there is less activation energy required. But if you look, the reverse reaction also has now less activation energy required. So again, we don't see any shift in the equilibrium and neither reaction is favored. So be aware of those two. Adding an inert gas, something from group 18, or adding a catalyst is not going to change the rate of the reaction. Finally, for aqueous solutions uh, that are saturated, you might run into the common ion effect. Common ion effect basically just changes in concentration. You've got a solution of sodium chloride. Let's say you add barium chloride. Well, effectively, you're going to be increasing the concentration of the chloride ion, and the reaction should shift towards the reactant side or shift towards the left, favor the reverse reaction to get rid of the excess chloride ion that was added. Same holds true if you add a common cation, this time in our original equation and in the substance added, the sodium ion is present. If we increase the concentration of the sodium ion, the system is going to react to decrease the concentration. So it'll favor the reverse reaction. And again, more sodium chloride will be formed. Um, anytime you're working with a common ion effect, adding an ion in common always shifts back towards the reactant side or favors the reverse reaction. All right, uh, that kind of wraps it up for this lesson. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope that helps out with Le Chatelier's principle.